It is the song that we sang as the song of meditation, which is in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. It is in Christ alone who took on flesh, who died on the cross, and as the scriptures say, he rose from the dead. To understand this truth of the gospel and to know the robust truth that it is in Jesus and the hope that we have in Christ, it is indeed in Christ alone. I want you to remember that phrase throughout the duration of this sermon. When we come to worship together, there should always be an enthusiasm in the air. There ought to be not only an enthusiasm in the air, but an expectancy as well. That God is going to do something wonderful. God is going to do something great. But I'm afraid too many times, if I'm to speak truthful, as I hope that you have confidence in me that I will, too many times we come into God's house and we look as if somebody stole our car. We look as if somebody has started our day off in the wrong way, but praise the Lord like you know that he is alive. And that's the exhortation from Paul. Praise Jesus like you know that he's not in the grave anymore, but that he is alive. Praise the Lord like you know that he lives. Today that sermon will focus on that zeal, worship with zeal. Not in the things that we have done, but the zeal of who Jesus is. Not with our feelings, not with partialities, but in Christ alone. And I'm glad these guys shared with us this morning their experience through Infuge. And it's great to see them growing in their faith and growing in their faith in Jesus. And I believe that you can identify with this next statement. Now that you are in Jesus, now that you are in Christ, it is time now to refrain from childish things and move on and grow up in, in Christ. I'm afraid there are adults who haven't grasped the hold of that concept even, even now. It was David Brees that said, Baptist theologian, David Brees said this, strong sons of God are not perfected by childish pursuits. Strong sons of God are not perfected. Our faith is not perfected by childish pursuits. You'll never grow in your faith if you're still clinging to immature hindrances. So thank you guys for sharing with us, sharing your testimony, your experiences. And I'll invite you once more to look in Philippians chapter 3, the scripture portion of scripture this morning, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I'll invite you, if you will, let's gaze into those scriptures again. The Apostle Paul, like these guys shared their experience and their testimony. The Apostle Paul had a testimony. The Apostle Paul had a testimony and it stands written in the word of God that any work of salvation is in Christ alone. If there's any true pedigree of righteousness, it is found in Christ alone. Now, before we jump into chapter 3, I want to backtrack just a hair back into chapter 2. The last time we were in Philippians, we looked at two individuals and we tried to learn from their lives. We tried to glean some characteristics of their walk with the Lord that might help us in our walk with the Lord as well. These two men that we spoke about was Timothy and Epaphroditus, two ordinary men that God used for the advancement of the gospel and to make disciples amongst the church at, at Philippi. Now we, we find in Timothy a young man with a servant's heart, had a genuine, a genuine concern for the spiritual health and vitality of the church. Paul says of Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. He looks after the well-beings of others. He looks at other needs before his own. You know that's the type of servants we need in this church? You know that's the type of deacons that we need in this church? Those that put the needs of their families above the needs of their own? In fact, this is the type of servants that we must become. Timothy served with Paul, was faithful. 
Then we find of Epaphroditus, who the same could be said of Epaphroditus. We find in Epaphroditus, he was a co-laborer for the gospel, arm in arm with Paul. He was a soldier for Christ and for the good news. When we sing the song, Onward Christian Soldiers, Epaphroditus should come to mind. Onward Christian Soldiers. Now both men exemplified placing the need of others before their own. In fact, it is because of people like Timothy and Epaphroditus and because of these folks in our congregation that serve selflessly that Paul says the very end of chapter 2, so honor such men. Because in the very end of all things, these people who we honor, as Paul says, honor Timothy and Epaphroditus, a servant's heart. In return, these people will always magnify Christ first. So with our Bibles turned, Philippians chapter 3, we venture into this portion of Scripture. I'm going to read chapter uh, 3 verse 1, and then we're going to pray together. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. It is for your benefit that I write unto you. Lord, we ask you to add your blessing not to the reading of the word only, but to our hearts and our minds. Father, that the church will hear what the Spirit has to say through your word. And I pray, God, that you will speak to us, help us to grow in our faith. And I pray it in Jesus' great name. Amen. Now we know that this is not the conclusion of the letter. We know because hopefully you have read ahead and you know there's a chapter 4. So we know that this finally is not the finality to the letter itself. We know that this is not the conclusion to the letter but it is to cap off one idea or one thought and move into another. Now comes encouraging words and also more words of warning from the Apostle Paul. What is the warning and what is the admonition? What is the admonition and what is the encouragement? Well, faithful, zealous worship includes being watchful. Faithful, zealous worship includes being watchful. Have you ever seen someone stand? I know these guys are talking about seeing uh, students, arms raised, Praising the Lord. That does something to you, doesn't it? It makes you want to praise the Lord all the more. Have you ever seen someone worshiping the Lord, whether through singing or music or the melody, and you thought to yourself, I want to be free like her. I want to be free in worship like him. I want to be free to say amen. I want to be free to, to raise my hand in, in praise. I want to be free in worship. And you can be. You can be. Watching and listening to people praise the Lord around you is, is important. It can become contagious. But the same way that we are watchful for people praising and worshiping the Lord is the same way that the church must be on guard and watching for hindrances as well. To be on guard for those things and ideals and faulty ideals that will hinder worship, that will actually degrade worship. What, what are... Uh, what are, who are the people that, that, that we might find that hinder the time of meeting together in worship? Who or what ideas could, could be circulating in a local body that we must be aware of and have our eye upon and our finger of the pulse of those faulty ideas? Who or what is being said or done that hinders worship? When we sing in Christ alone or when we sing the solid rock, when we sing those songs, do you find something infinitesimal to criticize over? Or do you let the words of that song wash over you as if you were dying from a thirst and you needed a spring of fresh water to wash over you? Can we honestly sing in Christ alone with fervor and zeal? Can we honestly sing the solid rock and know and identify with the Savior on who we stand? Paul had to warn the church at Philippi to be watchful of people who try to cause conflict. To be aware. Now I know we've heard, always heard put your eyes on Jesus and that's true. We put our eyes on Jesus and be watchful as well. After the introduction of pressing the church to rejoice, 
he writes these words of warning. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate, mutilate the flesh. An exclamation, look out for these. In other words, don't let that mess stand. In other words, don't let that mess carry on. Don't let that mess go on and entertain tantrums or anger or spurts of anger. Don't entertain that. People, people uh, Paul had warned uh, this church on something that was very, very toxic. He says, look out for dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those that mutilate the flesh. Paul's warning here seems more toxic than the westernized idea of someone just getting mad and leaving. These people Paul marked as destructive. These people were marked as doing damage to the body of Christ. He says, look out for the dogs. It's, it's Paul writing this by mentioning those also that mutilate the flesh at the very end of that. We know that these are people regarded in the old covenant or circumcision. These are people that was referred to historically as Judaizers. The contention on circumcision can be found in your Bible in Acts chapter 15 on what is known as the Jerusalem Council. These were Hebrews that taught that Gentile believers had to be, if they were Christ followers, they had to also fall under the law and be circumcised as well. So he identifies these people, evildoers, dogs, mutilate the flesh. He, he identifies or defines these people and their actions into three characteristics. They were dogs, they were evildoers, and then they were legalists, adding on to the grace of God. It's ironic that Paul calls them dogs. It's ironic because considering this is the same exact words that Pharisees and Sadducees used to describe Gentiles. In fact, historically Jews considered Gentiles as dogs. They, they did not keep the Torah, so the Gentile, according to the Orthodox Jew, was a little beneath them. To call a person a dog is a very severe insult. In fact, the Jews used to call, Orthodox Jews used to call Gentiles something like Gentile dog, an infidel dog, and later on, as the church was born, Christian dog. Now, Paul turns the table. I want you to understand that Paul is not turning the table to degrade these Judaizers as a human being. He is not saying that they are less than human like the Judaizers might say against the Gentile. He is not degrading the Imago Dei, them being made in the image and likeness of God. He is not degrading them in any way as a human being, but he is characterizing their behavior. Paul was saying in a very explicit way, these people were scavengers. They were people always snapping at the heels of Christ's people. They were ankle biters against the work of the true gospel. Always yelping. You know anyone who's always yelping? They were evil workers who tried to add works to salvation. And Paul says, look around. Be aware of these people. In fact, be aware of the people that try to add good works to their faith. Be aware of those who are boastful. Be aware of those who will stand and say, look at what I have done without hardly mentioning the gospel or Jesus. Then Paul writes, the true measure of purity is not found in the cutting or, or, or works itself. In fact, he says, well, what is this measure of purity? We find that we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. The true Christ follower has a new heart. If you're born again in Jesus, you have a new heart. As circumcision is the metaphor for purity, now the Christ follower finds their purity in Christ alone. One of the most backwards acts I think that a Christ follower can do is going back trying to put confidence in the work of their hands versus the nail-driven hands of our Lord. But Paul as this play on words. Put no confidence in the flesh. Being watchful of these acts. Being watchful of them in a church can help. Here's what, here's what can happen. We have our eyes on Jesus 
Turn your eyes to Jesus, right? But are also being watchful. And being watchful for things that degrade worship will help build trust. It will help build cohesion. It will help us to learn how to trust in the work of Christ instead of the work of our hands. Put our eyes on Jesus, but be aware of those things that are degrading and detrimental to our worship. I used to work with the city of Jacksonville many Many of you knew that I, I worked with the city for 11 years. I worked uh, part uh, seven years driving a truck, a garbage truck. And for those years, I spent on the ground. I, I worked for them 11 years, and the Lord called me to the ministry. And I would always jokingly say, somebody asked me what I did. I was always, I'd always try to, quote, unquote, church up my job description by saying, by saying, yeah, I am a refuse transfer technician. And they'll say, well, don't try to church it up, son. You're a garbage man, right? I started out on the ground as what they called a toter or a puller. And I would have to go behind the house, collect the garbage, and come out to the street. I remember one Tuesday route, we, had work, we were working in an apartment complex. And we would work one side and come down the other. But I noticed on the opposite side that I, I, saw, I caught a glimpse of this little black shepherd dog. And he was just staring at me from around the corner. And, and I remember, I'm going to keep my eye on him, not knowing my, what might happen if I turn my back on him. So we worked one side and collected and worked away. And after we came up on the one side where the dog was at, I had forgotten that he was lurking back there. I went in the yard to collect the refuse. And as I walked away, I felt a quick and hard pressure on the back of my leg. It felt as if I, my leg was run over by a bicycle. And I knew what that felt like because my brother and I would always just run up on one another and run over each other with our bicycles. So I knew what it felt like. I had first-hand experience. But it was not a bicycle at all. I turned around and the dog was just sitting there snarling at me. He had taken a bite out of my leg. Well, I grabbed a bag and I chased them around the yard for probably a few seconds. Then ended up going over to the doctor's office and having them look at it and and the, and the dog had to go off, of course, uh, under observation. The point being is this. It was when I got my eyes off of that dog that he attacked. And it is the same for us as well. Do not lose sight of the things that hinder our worship. Do not let them go. Do not let those ideas and faulty ideas go to the side. Do not lose sight of gossipers. Do not lose sight of slanderers. And when people are unsaved and want to pull us away from true fervent worship, mark them out. These Judaizers were trying to get the church's eyes off of Jesus and ultimately try to place it in their own authority. Power play. Trust me, not Paul. Trust what we say, not Paul. And so they were trying to gain power and popularity. These people thought that they had a pedigree to be admired and to look at as, as if they achieved something for God. But then Paul writes this, even though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason, confidence in the flesh, I have more. And what are these reasons? Well, Paul lays out these reasons. He, he, he lays it out in his resume. You think you've got something to boast out? Let me show you, Paul says. Well, what we find in these next selection of Scripture is this. Boasting in the flesh is a detriment to worship. Boasting in the flesh is a detriment and hindrance to worship. So here's Paul's resume. Circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now we like to think that we have done a little bit of work for the Lord. In fact, from time to time, we might think that we need a little pat on the back. Sometimes we might think that we've done something. We've collected this much money or this many items. And sometimes we like to think that we have a little bit of of, of clout and need a little pat on the back. We might lay out all that we have done or all that we're doing and we like to boastfully broadcast this uh, to the world of our faithfulness. If anyone had a reason to boast in their work or their lineage, it was the Apostle Paul. Uh, as was first commanded in Genesis 17 and verse 12, the scripture reference before you, Paul was circumcised on the eighth day. And so his parents were faithful to the law. We find that Paul was a law keeper, kept the law to the letter. He was a descendant of Israel or Jacob. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. 
We know that the tribe of Benjamin also located near the temple. So the idea would be supposed that the closer you were to the temple, the closer that you are to the church, the more closer to worship or to Yahweh that you might be. I've come across people sometimes would say, I want the preacher, I want you to pray for me, preacher, because you, you, you know how to get a hold of the man upstairs. If you're in Jesus, you can get a hold, not of the man upstairs, but the indwelt Spirit of God. You don't, you don't need to get a hold of the man upstairs, the old man upstairs. Just because someone is called to preach doesn't mean they're a little bit closer to God than someone else. I'm glad that you have confidence in uh, the praying pastors or elders or deacons. I'm glad you do. But, but it, in, this is a faulty way of thinking. In terms of boastfulness, it might make sense. But this is not, this is not the God we serve. Paul would say, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He held his heritage high and high regard. The expression implies this, this, uh, this faithful language and behavior. He was faithful to, to the Hebrew language. He was faithful to his mannerisms, faithful to traditions, faithful to behaviors. And even though he was a Hebrew, he would speak the common Greek language of the day and still held his Jewish customs and language high. It would be like a person today saying uh, of another person, he or she is a true American. He or she, she is true to her American heritage. To keeping the law of Pharisee as opposed to the Sadducees who would oppose any supernatural inclination. They would say there's no angels. They would say there is no uh, resurrection. But Paul was opposite to that as a Pharisee and believed in the resurrection of the dead. Paul thought that he was doing the will of God by persecuting Christians. He thought that he was doing a good work and he thought that any Christ follower, any Christian was an affront to the work of Yahweh. That is until he met Christ on the road to Damascus and all of his resume, all that he had done melted away in the presence, in the presence of Christ on that road. The righteousness, Paul would say, I have done everything meticulously from my youth up and in respect to the law, I'm blameless. And then he says, whatever gain I have, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. All that I had, all that I've accomplished is nothing under the shadow of the cross of Christ. All that I have done, all the work of my hands, everything that I have tried to exalt, saying, look at all that I have done, it pales in comparison and it falls under the shadow of what Christ did on the cross. And then he says... I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. And he says I count them as rubbish. Oh, that's rubbish. In order that I might gain Christ. Don't hold on to the past. Things that you have done in the past to try to inherit some type of righteous standing with God. But he says be, to be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. You see I've underlined this in my notes. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, those things that I have achieved, but that which comes through faith in, in Christ, the righteousness for God that depends on faith. It doesn't matter in terms of salvation or eternal security, how much you have slipped into the church's account. It doesn't matter how much you have slipped in, to, in terms of eternal security, what you, have, what you have placed into the general fund or into the offering plate. Consider what Christ has done. Consider your good works. Consider your good deeds. They are not even close. All acclimates and all work of the hand, Paul says, are to be like dung and to be thrown away or wasteful. It's interesting, the origin of this word for rubbish or dung in your King James. It is waste that would be thrown to the dogs. The translation it would simply mean or entail waste to be thrown to dogs. So it's very stern, very harsh tone from the Apostle Paul, almost coming full circle to the beginning of this. Then listen to these last verses. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, not the things that I have acquired, Becoming like him in death, that by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. Now, I'm going to end on this. I'm going to end on this. Paul's pedigree didn't, didn't matter a bit in terms of security and salvation. It didn't matter one bit. 
in boasting in his flesh, it would have caused a detriment and a harm to the church at Philippi in their worship. They would not have heard many, of what, many words of what Paul had said if he had tried to lay out all that he did in terms of, look at the work of my hands. But Paul says what really matters is the work of Jesus, his resurrection from the dead. And I love this verse in Christ alone that says, There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then, bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. Somebody say amen there. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Not bought with what I've done, not bought with the work of my hands, not bought with what I put in the offering plate, not bought by my baptism, not bought by my attendance, but bought by the precious blood of Christ. It is not the work of my hands. It isn't my past pedigree. It isn't my good deeds. It's not my accomplishments. It is the blood of Christ. It is his death. It is his resurrection. And worshiping in zeal entails that we disregard everything that is a hindrance to us. Leave those things out of worship. Those things that, are dis that, that denigrate our worship. Everything that is a hindrance, be watchful for them. And then to have confidence in Christ, not in self, but in Christ alone. Let's pray together.